In this next video, I want to discuss the Caravaggisti, and I want to discuss two Caravaggisti, Orazio Gentileschi and his daughter Artemisia Gentileschi. And we'll start with looking at Orazio's painting. Orazio is a Caravaggisti because of the formal qualities that he has and also some of the content or symbols that he's using. So if you look at this painting, it's basically the Holy Family, and it's depicted in such a way that you could imagine if you were from the 17th century, the 1600s, that you were, uh, that this was your family. So for instance, on the left-hand side, there's Joseph, and he's reclining, and it recalls a pose from uh, Caravaggio's painting, The Conversion of St. Paul with the foreshortening. However, Caravaggio does it a little bit, um, almost disrespectfully, where he puts Paul underneath the horse but we still have that same foreshortening. Then we have Mary and the infant Jesus, and all of them are sort of sanitized in a, in a way that it's different from what Caravaggio would have done. Caravaggio and Genileschi both use genre sorts of elements. So for instance, these are everyday people dressed in clothing from the 1600s, so that gets you to relate to them, but Caravaggio would have made them a bit messier, would have made them look dirty. And if you look at how quaffed Mary is. Her hair is in place. Everybody looks clean. Everybody looks bathed. You don't get to see the bottom of people's feet. Um, the clothing is not ripped. However, we still have a lot of the same elements that Caravaggio uses in terms of the form. We have a slightly reduced palette where it's earth tone colors, not a lot of saturated color. We also have a light raking in from the right to the left hand side. So there's strong chiaroscuro and a bit of tenebrism where things sort of dissolve into the background, although in this painting, not so much. And we have a sort of diagonal running through the composition, especially made by that little ledge in the back and how it corresponds and your eye sort of moves down to Mary's hand in the right hand corner. Now, Orazio had a daughter who he was training to be a painter. Orazio's daughter, Artemisia, was uh, probably, there are several reasons why she was trained to be a painter. And so I wanted to compare her in some ways to Sophonis Banguasola to sort of spark your memory and make you think about female painters. There are some really great historians who have discussed the subject of um, female painters, and one in particular, I believe it was Linda Nochlin, wrote an article called Why Have There Been No Great Female Painters? And that's the title of her article, and it's really the thesis. And the answer to that is there were no great female artists early because they were denied access to the schools in which they would have been trained, meaning that women were only trained as painters for various reasons that were highly personal, but also some of them were more pragmatic. So for instance, we know in the case of Sofa Nisma Anguissola, one of the reasons why she was probably trained as a painter was her father didn't have enough money to provide a dowry for all of his children. And so all of his kids were actually, all of his female uh, offspring were trained to paint because it would have made them more desirable and more attractive to a suitor if he couldn't provide cash for them. So it was sort of training in a way. And so in this portrait that depicts Sofa Nisba Anguissola's sisters, uh, they are depicted as being uh, very well-dressed, uh, very polite. They are chaperoned by that governess in the right-hand side, and they are good at playing games, which would make them entertaining. Well, if you look at Artemisia, she is not well-dressed in some ways, and um, she's a little disheveled, and we'll get to that in a second. Another reason why, um, you know, probably Artemisia would have been trained as a painter, aside from the fact that maybe Orazio wanted to give her training to provide a sort of additional impetus to get her married, sort of as a, as a dowry, is that he probably just loved her and she was very talented and he wanted to train her to become a painter. So by the age of 15, she is, uh, or 15 or 16, she's a very accomplished painter and because she can't go to the academy in Rome, she paints a portrait of herself as an allegory of painting. So she's the personification of painting. That's what an allegory is. That's why it's sometimes called the La Pittura. And around her neck, she dangles this um, medallion, which is actually the medallion uh, that you would have gotten had, you, um, had she graduated from the Roman academy. And so she's sort of awarding herself this this academic medallion, this pendant, but she hasn't actually earned it by going to school. And the way she sort of gets around the fact that she has her father's medallion around 
his, her neck is that she's saying she is the personification of painting. It's not a portrait of her. Now, an interesting thing about how she's painting here, uh, which I think is really uh, kind of neat, is that she set up a bunch of mirrors so that she could look down on herself from that strange angle. Because can you imagine uh, doing a self-portrait like this and trying to paint yourself from this kind of point of view? It'd be very difficult. It's a little different in some ways than other portraits we're going to look at. For instance, Sofonisba Anguissola's uh, self-portraits, even when she is painting, uh, and most often in most of her paintings she is not painting, um, she is usually put together much better. She is, she is very attractive and she's not disheveled at all. And later on we're going to look at uh, a painter named Vigie Lebrun who um, uh, portrays herself the same way. She makes herself very beautiful even while she's painting and very well put together. Artemisia chooses not to, and I suspect that this is part of her personality and also partly related to some events concerning her own biography. Her biography, Artemisia Genelesky's, is one that in which basically there's a lecherous older man involved, uh, I think named Tasso or Tassi. I'm getting, I can't remember the name exactly. I guess I should have looked that up first. So Tasso uh, is a former uh, pupil of her father, Orazio Genelesky. And Artemisia, at about the age of 16, comes to her dad and says, Dad, I need a little bit more training. Could you apprentice me under a painter who is a little bit further along and a little bit more accomplished than you who can teach me some other stuff? She starts working with Tasso and he seduces her. And he's in his middle age. He's probably in his mid-40s, something like that. And he says, um, I'll marry you if you sleep with me. Well, turns out he's already married. And in the Catholic Church, especially at this time, you could not get divorced. So she has basically been raped uh, because it, it, under Italian law at that time, if you were married and, uh, well, if, if someone promises to marry you and you have sex out of wedlock, basically there, it's a breach of contract and it's rape. So what happens to her, which is also fairly interesting, is she is um, brought to court and this is common practice at this time in the 1600s and actually before that, that they would actually torture the witnesses to see if they could get the truth out of them. And obviously this isn't a really effective way of getting the truth out of anybody because they'll say anything while they're being tortured to stop being tortured. However, interestingly enough, Artemisia, the 16-year-old girl, she has thumb screws on her, on her hands, which are extremely painful, and she actually sticks to her story. So Tasso is thrown in jail for, I think, something like six to eight months, and um, she has lost, it has destroyed her reputation. Now, when all of this is over, her, her reputation is destroyed, and interestingly enough, she does manage to get married again, but she's notorious. And I think she used her notoriety uh, in such a way to market her paintings. She paints a lot of depictions of this scene that's called Judith and Holofernes. And the story of Judith and Holofernes really ties in quite a bit with this portrait. And it's a story from the Apocrypha, which is a sort of middle section of the Bible. Um, it's actually a story having to do with a beautiful um, young Jewish woman who is a widow. So let me tell you the story, and then we'll discuss these two paintings, because I think that it really fits in with a lot of what's going on in her life. The story of Judith is basically the story of enemies um, attacking the state of Israel. And Judith is the widow of a, of a young man, and she is ex described as being extremely beautiful, and she's extremely pious. So in uh, the first chapter, she's described as basically when, how she mourns and how she really sticks to the, the rules uh, honoring God and the covenant that, that the Jews have made with God. And so what happens with her is she is in this town that is attacked uh, by um, this general named Holofernes, who has been instructed by his lord, Nebuchadnezzar, to go to this town and, uh, and to go through Israel and basically attack all the cities uh, in the near and far east and, and, you know, basically have control, dominion over these places. And one of the sort of little rules that he says is, is they don't surrender to you immediately, just go in and, and kill them anyway. Um, and uh, so he attacks this town that Judith is living in. And the town elders are so thirsty and there are no provisions in the town that they are actually like asking God um, 
instead of asking God to deliver them, they're asking God more or less for a favor. And you can read the Bible passage in a little bit more depth, but basically they're starting to, uh, to um, die of thirst. If, if they don't get water soon, they're going to die. And, sh and they're so, because Holofernes is outside the gates, he's, he's basically saying, um, let me in, surrender, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and of course they say, well, maybe we'll surrender. And Judith uh, sees this as a threat to their faith, and she thinks that God is actually testing them. So Judith makes a decision. Judith goes to the town elders and says, you know, basically, you guys are in the wrong, and God is testing us, and we need to do something about this. So what I want to do is I want to uh, sort of um, fast and take care of myself, wear sackcloth and all that kind of stuff. And then uh, she gusses herself up. And so the Bible passage describes her as basically, you know, once she, uh, she uh, fasts and, and pays penance and things like that, she gets her stuff together and uh, gets together a bunch of food. And she decides to go out of the town and go and talk to Holofernes because she believes that God will deliver them if she goes out of the, uh, the gates of the town and decides to do this. And because she has uh, basically fasted, God has sort of marked her. And that's one of the, the things about a hero um, in a lot of uh, mythology in general, but also in the Bible, that very often the hero is marked in some ways. And in her instance, she is marked by being extremely beautiful and glowing with a sort of radiance. So what happens is she uh, leaves the town. And when she goes to the enemy camp, the guards are so freaked out by how beautiful she is uh, that they bring her to the general Holofernes, who is sort of described as being very decadent. He, uh, when she is brought to him, he's in a bed with uh, that's purple, which is a very expensive color, and it has gold and emeralds and stones, precious stones and things like that. And he falls sort of in lust with her within, in such beauty, and he invites her to stay in his camp for several days so that they can talk about peace. You know, It's basically an attempt by him to seduce her. And um, he allows her to pray, and she continues to to be a pious, beautiful woman who uh, you know who is who is keeping her covenant with God. And um, but Holofernes and his and his men are basically we need you you need to seduce this woman. You need to rape her more or less. And uh, because you know what are they going to think of us if we can't even seduce a, a beautiful woman? And we'll be disgraced if you don't do this. So basically, Holofernes kind of has a plan. And if you read the Bible passage, it basically describes how he plans to more or less get her drunk and have a party. The Bible passage describes more or less that it grew late and his staff hurried away. What, what I kind of interpret that to mean is Holofernes sort of instructed them that, um, you know, he's going to get her drunk and he's and then he's going to have his way with her. And uh, I my fantasy is she pours her drinks into the potted palm in the corner and he passes out on the bed. And so Judith, uh, actually, when he passes out, I, I love this. He he's on the bed and uh, and uh, she she basically takes down his sword from the wall. Um, you know, here in the Bible, it kind of <laughs> describes it. Uh, standing beside the bed, Judith murmured to herself, Lord God, to whom all strength belongs, prosper what my hands are now to do for the greater glory of Jerusalem. Now is the time to recover your heritage, to further my plans, to crush the enemies arrayed against us. With that, she went up to the bedpost by Holofernes' head, took down his scimitar, coming closer to the bed, she caught him by the hair and said, make me strong today, Lord God of Israel. She twice struck at his neck with all her might and cut off his head. Then she rolled his body off the bed and rolled down the canopy from the bedpost, after which she went and gave the head of Holofernes to her maid, who put it in her food bag. Then the two left the camp together, as they always did when they went to pray. Once they were out of camp, they skirted the ravine and climbed the slope to Bethulia, her town, and made for the gates. And basically, the end of the story is she hangs the, his head out on the gates, and uh, the Persian army is so demoralized that they have to uh, split town, um, and uh, they have lost because they messed with the Jews who were, who were in power and, and basically kept their faith with God. Now, these two paintings depict 
the high point, <laughs> the climax of the story in which Holofernes is getting his head chopped off. One of them is made by Artemisia Gentileschi, and one of them is made by Caravaggio. And usually what I do is I do a sort of blind taste test in my class, and I show these two paintings, and I ask the students which one they think is by Artemisia and which one they think is by Caravaggio. And if you start with a formal analysis of the two paintings, you can see that the uh, one on the right seems to be a little bit more smoothed out, a little bit more put together. It... Um, shows uh, you know, basically a little bit less of an active pose on the part of, the, of Judith. The woman who is standing behind Judith, who is basically her maid or her, her sort of um, chaperone, is an old woman who um, looks a little bit freaked out by the whole thing. And we see this beautiful drapery that's been painted very carefully. And uh, it, in, on the whole, it's, it has all of those characteristics. We have reflected light on the head, and we've got this strong chiaroscuro. And the, those are some things that are kind of shared with the one on the left. However, the one on the left is, has a little bit more gesture, and the drawing is a little less stiff. It's a little bit more uh, free. It shows a little bit more of the weight and energy. We call that gesture of the movements of the figures on the left-hand side. And if you look at it a little bit more of the content of it, you'll see that the the maidservant is actually a young woman, and Judith is a, is a, a young woman who's almost showing some cleavage. Uh, and we see her struggling with Holofernes on the bed. So what my students usually say is that the one on the right is Caravaggio uh, because of the way that it's painted. And they suspect that it's Caravaggio because it shows a little bit, it's a little stiffer, and maybe it, it, it shows um, an apprehension uh, on the part and of of the painter. And the one on the left really shows a lot of anger. It's sort of an expression of, of the anger, and that might relate to Artemisia's, um, her biography and, and the uh, notorious thing that was, uh, you know, her reputation and, and how she was sort of degraded and how, in a way, she's trying to get back at that. And, um, of you know, obviously the one on the left is by Artemisia Gentileschi and the one on the right is by Caravaggio. And it may tie in a little bit with um, contemporary psychological theory sort of suggests the idea that decapitation, uh, in, in, especially in biblical scenes, is a warning um, uh, uh, more or less about castration, that, that, that it's a sort of metaphor uh, for castration, that uh, the decapitation of, of the male head. And if you really think about it, just even in terms of metaphorical terms, when a, a guy loses his head and he lets his bottom half run away with him, uh, that is a sort of form of, uh, of losing your mind in a way and you, get your, and you become decapitated in a way in terms of your, intel, in, your intellect. And that might be one of the reasons why Artemisia picked up this uh, theme and painted it so often. And there are many depictions that Artemisia does of this kind of scene. And we can see that the one on the right-hand side, she's actually sort of playing or correcting the original schema of the one on the left-hand side. And what I'm talking about is um, she does something that I hadn't seen before, and Caravaggio never does. She includes the light source in the image, and she has her hand up in front of that light source, because if you've ever walked with a candle into a dark room, you actually need to shield your eyes from the candle itself so you can see beyond it. Uh, an interesting element also is that she actually has the maidservant in the foreground uh, on the bottom of the painting shoving Holofernes' head into that food sack that we, we uh, just learned about. And in both of these paintings, the composition is a little irregular. The light creates some strong diagonals running through them. We have high contrasts of light and shadow that are typical of the Caravaggisti. And also the genre elements of them being dressed in um, 17th century Italian clothing, uh, even though this is a biblical scene, is a way of getting you to relate to this as if it could be happening right now, right at this point in time. And so, you know, if we were to paint this today with the same kind of attitude, we'd put people in blue jeans or we'd put them in, in, in sweatsuits and things like that, or maybe in club clothing or something, in, in more contemporary clothing. We also know that Artemisia really um, painted a bunch of these scenes. And, and my theory about this is basically that she, people would have sort of chuckled and they would have known what this scene meant and that what it meant to her and that it referenced 
how angry she was in some ways. And there are other paintings by Artemisia that kind of show the kind of anguish that a female might feel in this culture who had been sort of wronged in this way.